Thanks for watching this episode of Angry Video Game Nerd. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN takes the data you send over the internet and shields it from prying eyes by wrapping it in a protective bubble for you called a virtual private network. Your data is then sent through a secure tunnel to its destination. ExpressVPN is also the highest rated VPN out there, which brings me comfort knowing my information is safe. I also love how I can change my online location to another country, opening up thousands of hours of geo-blocked streaming content only available in other countries. April is a good month to watch Critters 2. However, it's not on Netflix USA. But with ExpressVPN, I switched my location to Australia and the movie popped up instantly, all in crystal clear high definition without any buffering. And with over 100 servers from different countries to choose from, I'm always confident I can find what I need. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by going to expressvpn.com slash cinemassacre or by clicking the link in the description below. Let me ask you something. You ever heard the legend of the monkey's paw? It's a mystical, cursed item that appears as a severed hand of a monkey or an ape. And with each of its fingers, it grants a wish to the person who finds it. It's been used for greed and lust, and it always ends in tragedy. Well, long ago, as a kid, I found the monkey's paw. <gasps> and you know what I wish for? I wish that when I grew up, I'd make a living playing video games. And I got that wish. <sighs> Playing shitty games! <laughs> Playing shitty games! Oh, the sorrow! Oh, the devastation of the human soul! <sighs> oh, and the worst thing is that the other finger I wish for candy and shit, and then the thumb I found out didn't count. That's a ripoff. But I still have two wishes left. I'm gonna do it. I wish to play a good game. Now that's what I'm talking about! Contra! This classic run-and-gun shooter first landed in the arcades. Set in the year 2633 AD, you take control of the Earth Commandos, blasting away extraterrestrial creatures, robots, and brainwashed human armies. The visuals and aesthetics were heavily influenced by the Alien films, as was Metroid, Xenophobe, and probably too many games to count. It found its way into the home on computers such as the MSX2, Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, DOS, but yeah, 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 we're talking NES. Funny that the PAL version was called Probotector, which changed the characters into robots, but I'm talking the good old violent flesh and blood human version. Let me make clear, I will go back to playing bad games, but for this occasion, let's think outside the toilet bowl. It's definitely not the first time. A while ago, I made a Castlevania retrospective, which was also a Konami franchise. But here, I just want to focus on the first two NES games. This is Contra, how I remember it. When I first saw that cover, I was blown away. Two Rambo characters with a xenomorph alien head sneaking up on them. Sometimes my dad let me see those type of movies, but I didn't realize at the time the character on the left was clearly modeled after Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator. And if the guy on the right with the dark hair and headband is Rambo, then that's one hell of a team. You put the game in, you start it up, and you see that badass title screen slide in. Straight to the point, like, oh shit, here it comes. Dun, 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 dun! Then, no story, no wall of text, you just drop from the sky, and the action begins. Yeah! 
So you're just racing through, blowing through level after level, laying waste to everything. No, hang on. It was nothing like this, playing it for the first time as a kid. Let me take you back to what it was really like. Fuck! You watch your language in there, mister! The difficulty is fair, you're given the freedom to shoot in all directions, making your targets accessible, and when you jump, you curl into a ball, making the hitbox smaller so you can dodge enemy fire more effectively. With all the freedom you have, whenever you fail, it's all on you. It's not over something ridiculous. You die, you learn, you do better. Never do you feel like you hit a dead end or don't know what to do. It's just simply about practice and pure concentration. That's why this game is so addicting. It blocks out all other unhappy thoughts, where your only focus is on the geometry and split-second reaction time of dodging those projectiles. You go into a Contra trance. And whenever I'm in this trance, this is what I have to say. Even though you die by one hit, it lets you continue where you left off. It doesn't force you to backtrack, not unless you lose all your lives. And you know what that's called? Fair. Of course, I should mention the famous Konami code. It was in Nintendo Power, but famously spread through word of mouth. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. It gives you 30 lives, which is plenty. And that is the pure definition of cheat. This is a perfect example of a quality game. The hit detection is spot on. The satisfaction of eliminating targets. The controls respond so instantaneously it almost feels like it's happening directly from your brain. And the music is excellent. and the bosses are so awesome, you're always excited to see what's coming up next. I'll never forget my first impression of the Stage 3 boss. Oh, shit! That face snuck into my nightmares. This game is so good, you know what? It pisses me off it's so good. Here comes the part where I say bad things about the game. Um... Well, uh... Why do the characters wear blue and red? What kind of camouflage is that? Um... That's all I got. Come on, game! Give me something! That's how good it is. Trying to shake some shits out of this gem is gonna be tough. How about this? Why is there no boss music on stage three? They could have made this moment even more exciting if it wasn't the same music as the level. How about stage seven? They apparently ran out of music and recycled the theme from stage one. Hey, stage seven doesn't even really have a boss. I mean, you're basically fighting a door. I ain't never fought no door before. But you want to talk about strange bosses? How about stage four? It's a bunch of transformers that transform. And if you had any doubt, you're also fighting the Autobot logo. In Stage 6, what's up with the karate-kicking robot in front of the jukebox? I don't even know how he expects to hit me all the way up there. As far as pitfalls and hazards go, Stage 7 has those annoying spiked walls that pop up out of nowhere. Not that hard to avoid, but you gotta move cautiously. I especially like the ones that are just there already. Like, okay, wow game, you really slowed me down there. I don't know who's ever gotten killed by these things. I guess you can run into them, if you want. This is the flypaper approach. Let's just see if the player runs into it. Then there's the claws that go up and down. Those same claws show up again in Double Dragon 2. What's up with that? Reminds me of those annoying claw games in the arcade. You know, the ones where you pick up the toy. Has anyone ever successfully managed to pick up something with those pieces of shit? You know what I love? The spread gun. That is one of the best weapons in gaming history. Whenever that item drops and you get it, it is such a fulfilling moment to just spray bullets all over. And when you lose it, man, does that shed some tears. 
You ever accidentally pick up a weapon you don't want, like the laser? It usually happens when it lands in your way. Well, the laser is a good weapon because it's so powerful. I mean, look at how fast I annihilate the stage 5 boss. But you can only blast one stream at a time. If you tap it, it has a short range. Of course, I gotta talk about two-player mode. Even though the characters have official names, Bill Riser and Lance Bean, my friends and I always called them Blue Pants Guy and Red Pants Guy. If you merge together, you become Purple Pants Guy. Having two players does not make it any easier, because if you don't carefully plan every move and stay together, you're gonna get fucked. That's what makes this a great co-op challenge. Stay together! Stay together! Alright, now, right, now wait. Wait up. Oh, oh man, stop dying. All right, all right, go ahead. Take one of my lives. There you go. Oh, come on, again? Fuck. Shit, pickle. Shit, pickle, shit, pickle, shit, pickle. You want to know something really weird about this game? In single player mode, you can actually play with either controller. Yeah, that means if a friend wants to be an asshole, they could grab the second controller and mess you up. But there's a cool little trick I learned from the classified information booklet that came inside of Nintendo Power. On those three-dimensional hallway stages, if you duck on controller one while holding up on controller two, you can shoot higher. Yeah. The most coveted moment of any gaming experience is reaching that final level for your first time. It happened to me early one morning before the school bus came. I had a little extra time to kill and I had no idea I would make it that far. I actually felt nervous and creeps the fuck out. The ground looks like bloody flesh. There's skeletal aliens piled up. And next thing, these floating shrimp with teeth start coming at you. And then, oh dear, what the hell is that thing? That is probably one of the most terrifying bosses to come out of the 80s. And after you blow its head off, you can still see a portion of the neck. That's fucking brilliant. I've never seen in any game before where the remains of the boss become part of the background. Then you come to all these mouths. Yeah, mouths on the wall. Could you imagine just being a mouth on a wall of alien bodies? What would they talk about all day? Might be getting some rain! Hmm. Yeah. Blue Pants Guy! Blue Pants Guy! He's back! He's back! Ah! Oh! So, I heard the final boss was a heart. I had to see it for myself. I was picturing, like, a Valentine's heart. But then, I see this thing. A realistic disgusting, pulsating, beating heart with the subtle hint of a distorted face. Holy horrifying hell. Also, these things are totally the face huggers from Alien. Meanwhile, the school bus was coming any minute. My mom was calling me for breakfast, but I had to finish the game. I, I couldn't pause it. I mean, what was I going to do? How was I going to pay attention in class knowing I had a Contra game at home paused on the final boss? It was now or never. And just in the nick of time, BOOM! I couldn't believe it. I beat a Nintendo game. So I ate my breakfast, I got on the bus, I went to school, and then I bragged, Hey, did you ever beat Contra? Well, I beat Contra before breakfast. And then they were like, so what's the final boss? And I was like, uh, a giant heart. Yeah, sure. And if you want to get real crazy, after the ending, the game sends you back to level one, and with each playthrough, it gets harder and harder. Now that's what you call replay value. Here's the thing, Contra still would have been remembered as a masterpiece had it been only one game, but it was a two-punch combo. When I opened those pages in Nintendo Power number 12, it was like hot damn, especially when I unfolded that badass poster that came with it. Contra 2, I mean Super C, and it did not disappoint. As soon as you drop from that helicopter, it's on. This 
is when sequels were sequels. It plays exactly the same and feels just like more levels to the original, though the top view stages are new and a very welcome addition. The control is perfectly fluid and these stages are among my favorites. <laughs> Every time I blow up the stage 2 boss, I like to sit in the driver's seat. There's little details I enjoy. Just the fact that after you complete stage 1 and pass through the door, you can actually see yourself through the crack. Dude, stage 3? The first time I saw that robot spider stomping toward me, I almost shit my pants. What a great mini-boss. And that style of music kind of reminds me of that synthesizer score from the first Terminator film. That is the music of a machine coming to kill you. But nothing tops the end of stage six. It's a bunch of horrific faces merged together. You blast them away and watch the fireworks spectacular, which never gets old. Ah, love those sounds. But wait, it's not over. Ground starts shaking. Here it comes. Oh yeah, that face is amazing. There's something funny about it. I don't know what it is. Just look. Is there anything stupid in this game? Well, near the end of stage three, there's an earthquake. The ground opens up into pitfalls, but they give you the invincibility item here. It doesn't matter if you're invincible. If you fall in the pits, you die. So why of all places did they put the item here? Stage four, you have to keep stopping to blast away bubbles. Come on, bubbles? Why do bubbles kill you? No, really, how do the bubbles do harm? Maybe it's because these guys are so macho. They have such extreme pride in their masculinity that something like bubbles hurts them so deeply inside, it just flat out kills them. The boss of this stage is literally a showerhead shooting lasers. I wonder what function this thing serves on a normal day. Does some robot take a laser shower in it? The challenge is addicting, and this game boils down to instincts and memorizing patterns. For example, the stage 6 boss, the chrome-colored blob of skulls. You gotta aim for that target, but you can't because you gotta watch the ground for these little skulls. But you can't look at the ground because you gotta pay attention to those red things in the air. But you can't do that either because the game's driving you nuts. It's a combination of offensive-defensive strategies, but it becomes part of you. It's in your blood. Two-player mode is just as hard as ever. You gotta stay together or else this kind of shit happens. Especially on the earthquake part. At any stage where you're going up. The last two stages get out of hand with the alien references. I don't know whether to call them nods or rip-offs. But the creatures that hatch from the eggs are blatantly face huggers. And the xenomorphs are exactly that. They are xenomorphs from Ridley Scott's Alien. And if that's not enough, the final boss is the space jockey, the top part at least, which was the dead alien pilot from the original Alien and later Prometheus. I think Prometheus should have ripped off Contra, just for good measure. Anyway, the satisfaction of defeating that final boss is just as great as ever. And overall, I love this game just as much, if not more, than the first. Like Alien and Aliens, I think of them as a perfect pair. To me, the NES will always be the home of Contra, those first two games released in 87. But if you want to move over to the Game Boy for a second, there was a third Contra title released in 91, Operation C. This was the first portable Contra game, and surprisingly, it retains most of the smooth gameplay that you've come to know. So if you wanted to play Contra on the go, this one did not disappoint. Now, if you want to step into 16-bit territory, let's go over to the Super Nintendo. As announced in the Super Nintendo Player's Guide, the next game would be called Super Contra 4. But when it came out in early 92, it was called Contra 3, The Alien Wars. And as a successor, holy... Hell, this showed you the difference 16 bits made. Wow! Oh my 
my god, this is fucking awesome! It's fucking awesome! It's fucking awesome! Wow, Contra just keeps on being awesome. But then in late 92 came another NES title, Contra Force. Oh, it's shit! It's shit! It's shit! It's shit! Ah! What is up with the control? It's like you're moving underwater! And just to think, this came out after Super C. This is not a Contra game, and I mean that. In Japan, it was originally meant to be called Ark Hound, but was changed into a Contra game last minute after it was localized for North America. Contra Force? More like Contra Force the shit out your ass! In true Konami fashion, when it came to 16-bit, they gave us two different games. While Super Nintendo had Contra 3, Sega Genesis had Contra Hardcore in 94. How awesome was this? Well, just cue the fucking montage. This one gave you a selection of characters, including a wolf. A Contra game where you can play as a motherfucking wolf! It even had branching paths and six different endings, one where you go back in time and marry a monkey! Otherwise, it's the same run-and-gun action, with great variety, giant bosses, and all the good stuff you could ever ask for. And then we move over to the PlayStation, and here we have Contra Legacy of War! Oh, oh God! Oh. oh, and see the Contra Adventure! Oh, have mercy! Ah, make it stop! Oh, the shits! I can't take the shits! Ah, make it stop! Make it stop! Ah, <sighs> Contra 4 on the DS. Now that was a good one. Just like a classic Contra game, but portable. Of course, there's plenty more Contra games, and maybe some other time I'll go in depth with the bad ones. There could always be a new Contra game coming out, and uh, it might meet my approval, or might not. But it seems even with the best games nowadays, no matter how good, nothing will ever surpass my experience with those first two Contras on NES. And why is that? I don't know. And when compared to all the NES turds I've dissected, like Akari Warriors, Raid 2020, and Rambo, it begs the question, was Contra the standard? Or was it so far above standard, so exceptionally magnificent, that it made all the others suck. In that same way, I wonder if the past set an unreasonable standard for the future. Do we hold our childhood so dear because it was better or just familiar? When I think back to Contra, I'm not just remembering the 80s. I'm remembering that time in the 2000s when I was remembering the 80s. It's a memory that's been photocopied countless times. It's been through many filters and distortions. There's even major holes when I forgot about Contra for a bit. You know what happened to my original cartridge? I sold it. I sold it. Sometime after the N64 came out, I took a handful of my games and I brought them over to the local Funko Land. They offered me seven bucks for Contra and I accepted. You know what I did with that seven bucks? I went over to the deli and bought a sandwich. To this day, I'll never remember any details of that sandwich. Did it um have lettuce? Uh, was it any good? I don't know. Today, if you were to ask me, hey, you remember that sandwich? I'd say, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But Contra, 
that sticks with me. And even if I had to part with it for a while, sometimes you have to temporarily forget about something before you fall in love with it again. And when you come back to it, it's the same as it was. Even though everything else has changed, life has changed, the world has changed. But sealed in that plastic slab is a time capsule of your youth, fossilized in ROM data on a circuit board. It's read-only memory, the type that doesn't change. As soon as you pop that fucker in your NES, you're back. You're back to an innocent summer day with no such thing as internet. Instead, you and your friends are running around with Nerf guns and super soakers, pretending you're the guys from Contra. You're standing on a swing, holding onto its chains like a ladder of a helicopter. You jump off, rolling into the grass, the jungle. If it's not that, you're setting up G.I. Joe figures in the mud to stage epic battles. That skill you had of creating a fantasy land out of nothing, that wild imagination and backyard adventure was fueled by those pixelated military dudes blasting away alien creatures and robots. That's what Contra's all about. And maybe you lost touch with those old friends, but when you play that game once more, you think of them again. And maybe, just maybe, somewhere, in some part of the world, they're remembering it too. Almost as if they're still sitting on the living room floor beside you. And maybe you had a grandparent or family member who you lost, and they're still watching you play. Even as strangers, we can have a shared connection of talking about old games. And that is nothing to be angry about. That joy in its simplest form comes down to simply asking someone, Hey, remember Contra? And the answer is fuck yeah.